Hello, folks, and welcome to this webinar on how to uh, how social annotation can transform your JSTOR experience. Uh, maybe you're here because you're a JSTOR customer and you heard about it from our friends at JSTOR, represented by Alex Humphries here. Uh, maybe you heard about it um, uh, from Hypothesis because you're a Hypothesis customer. Um, and welcome. I'm Jeremy Dean, a Vice President of, uh, of Education at Hypothesis. Maybe you were just on Twitter and you saw an advertisement and you don't know about JSTOR or Hypothesis and you're totally new. We're going to take care of all audiences here today to talk about how social annotation can transform your JSTOR experience how social annotation can transform your reading experience and your reading experience of, of scholarly writing uh, generally. So if those are topics of interest, then you're in the right place. Uh, a couple pieces of housekeeping to go through first. Um, if you have a question, we'd love to hear it. Uh, there's a QA. and a We have some other folks here to help surface the cues that come up, and we'll do our best to aid them. Um, and uh, we will have a discussion section at the end. Uh, if you require or would like closed captioning, you can do that by turning it on in Zoom. Um, and I will say we tried to get an ASL interpreter for this event, but we're, we're unable to do so and but plan to do so for future events. And um, uh, so stay tuned for that. All right, let's get started. Um, I'm super excited to be here with my friends, Laisha and Alex. Um, this is now, we're like on tour. A couple of weeks ago, we were in Denver at the CNI concert, uh, concert, <laughs> CNI uh, conference, um, and talking about some of the same topics to a, a community of wonderful uh, librarians and deans. Um, and now we're here bringing bringing the show on the road, or I guess we were on the road. Now we're this is our hometown turf, the virtual space. In any case, I'm Jeremy Dean, Vice President of Education at Hypothesis. I'm joined by Alex Humphreys, Vice President of Innovation at JSTOR Ithaca. And we're joined uh, by Laisha Palin, who's a Distinguished Professor of Information Science and Computer Science at University of Colorado Boulder, and a uh, user of Hypothesis in the classroom. So we'll have a practitioner perspective. Um, an overview of the agenda here, uh, Alex will kick it off and talk a little bit about JSTOR and the use of JSTOR, uh, of, of content on JSTOR in the classroom. Uh, which for some of you may be, you know, a new idea. A lot of people use JSTOR for scholarly research, but I taught for many years and I would use JSTOR articles in my class. I'd make my undergrads, and even when I taught high school, I used JSTOR, I had my undergrads read articles from JSTOR. Um, so Alex will be talking about that. I'll give an introduction to hypothesis and talk a little bit about annotating with hypothesis and annotating JSTOR specifically with hypothesis. Um, and then we'll hear from Laisha about how she's used hypothesis um, on top of scholarly uh, writing in her undergrad courses at the University of Colorado Boulder. And then we'll have a little discussion uh, and Q&A. Um, and with that, Alex, I'll kick it to you. And I'll just say, I, I, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but do you, did you guys have those records growing up where I think uh, it, you would have a book that went along with it? And when it was time to turn the page, a little chime happened? Yeah. So you, you want me to sing? Uh, I, I, uh, you you could just however you want to signal the chime. I think different um, records sometimes incorporated it thematically, so it would be different. But uh, you can just let me know how to advance your slides whenever you like. If I'm not on cue, you, you got it. Thanks, Jeremy. And I'm 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 really happy to be here, and I really appreciate that introduction. And I'm happy to get to to, to kick us off. Bong. That was your cue, Jeremy. All right, maybe we won't do the bong anymore. Uh, so, so some background information just for folks who, who need it. I don't know, uh, as Jeremy said, we're not sure exactly uh, what, what knowledge everybody is coming with. So we wanna make sure you're scaffolded to know who you're talking with. Uh, we, I work at uh, uh, Ithaca, which is a not-for-profit dedicated to expanding access to knowledge and education for uh, people around the world. It does that through a variety of different brands that uh, do academic research or do research and uh, uh, consulting with Ethica SNR, preservation with Portico. We have a text analysis platform with Constellate. Um, uh, but I'm here today for about JSTOR, uh, which is an enormous digital library uh, and really just houses so much amazing material that is it is uh, used um, ding within the uh, uh, educational enterprise. Lo since JSTOR is primarily sold and available through libraries, people in higher education don't always think of it as being part of the teaching and learning enterprise. It's, it's sort of a library resource. Um, but I, I, you know, as Jeremy said, uh, 
uh, we're here to disavow you of that notion. JSTOR is very much a teaching and learning tool. Uh, it is used very often in the classroom. You can see here on this uh, funky little chart uh, the, that our seasonal peaks and valleys are very much driven by the academic calendar. Uh, a lot of that usage is uh, student driven uh, research. So writing the term paper over Thanksgiving break with too much turkey in your belly. Um, or, uh, but not all of it is. There's a good, there's a large portion of uh, our usage that comes from teachers like Jeremy um, who assign specific uh, articles, chapters, primary sources to their, um, to their materials. JSTOR has so much, it's a you know, full length of every, um, full run of every journal that there are canonical and really important uh, artifacts, especially in the humanities and sciences that, uh, that are shared within JSTOR. Um, next slide. The challenge, so the teachers are already doing that and that accelerated uh, greatly with the pandemic and online teaching uh, became more important that, so that, that has happened. But there are some, uh, as we began to look at that and really think about that a few years ago, uh, there are a lot of challenges um, for the way that's done currently. Uh, so that can happen in a few different ways. First of all, a teacher could simply include within their syllabus a, uh, a link to the JSTOR to the JSTOR article. Teachers do that all the time. They'll link to, to relevant material. As any teacher will tell you though, those, those links uh, can be lossy. You might lose a student on the way to wherever they're going. And that could be because the student has to click a whole button and that's really hard or because they're offline and they have to re-authenticate using their proxy server into the library before they get into JSTOR and that's friction, and that means that some number of students in your class are not going to follow that link all the way through, uh, and so will not have read the class, uh, the materials, and so class discussion is going to be um, impoverished because of that. Uh, so that's the first. So so that's the first sort of problem. Teacher might get over that by downloading the PDF from JSTOR, and we know teachers do this, uh, and posting it, uploading it to the LMS. And that way the student doesn't have to re-authenticate. That's great, but um, because it's hosted on a different platform, JSTOR doesn't see that usage and doesn't see its public, doesn't see, and our publishers don't see our usage. And we allocate revenue to our publishers based on that usage. And so it's actually against our terms and conditions to be able to do that. Teachers do it and uh, it's fine, but we'd love to find a way that would allow publishers to be able to get the credit so the authors can see the impact of their works, uh, which they're not seeing when that ha when the links are just shared like that, or PDFs are just shared like that. So those are just about access and, uh, and all of that. The other real hurdle here is that academic reading is, and learning how to do academic reading is a skill that has to be developed, has to be taught. Students and undergraduates all through um, their educational process process have to develop and build those skills. And uh, that can be really hard and intimidating. And there are, I, uh, there, there are far too few uh, supports for students as they're doing that, that, uh, that guilt building those skills. So as we began to um, explore these hurdles and look for ways to solve them, click, uh, we thought hypothesis might have something to say about that. Um, uh, so, we partnered with Hypothesis over this past year to pilot an integration that overcomes all of those different hurdles. Uh, we've developed that implementation this past semester or past uh, academic year. It's been implemented at around 30 institutions in the US. Uh, we've worked at each of those institutions with teaching and learning centers to train and support students as they use the integration. And then we've conducted a number of quali qualitative interviews to just make sure that we're doing the right thing and that it's helpful and that the materials that they're providing are, are supportive, uh, that they have the support they need. Uh, and I think Hypothesis has even published a case study of at least one of those. Uh, click. So, uh, what if you remember on the hurdle slide, we have all these frowny little sad X's. Now we have smiley faces. This uh, integration solves those problems. We'll show it to you in just like a second. Um, but just to summarize at a high level, what happens is a teacher assigns a particular JSTOR uh, 
uh, article or chapter or material within the learning management system and does so using the hypothesis learning management system integration. What that does is when they do that, the student gets access to the article directly within the learning management system. That means they don't have to re-authenticate. They don't have to go to a different place. It's, it's already there, but it's essentially a tunnel through the learning management system into JSTOR. So JSTOR sees the usage, publishers see the usage, the publisher's authors see the usage. Uh, and so they can see the impact that their materials having in classrooms, which is really exciting. Uh, and last and most exciting, at least to me, oh, don't, uh, is that Hypothesis provides the platform for uh, uh, for to, to to learn how to read scholarly material, and Leisha is really going to show you exactly what that means. I can't wait for you to hear from her. Click. Last, before I hand it over to Jeremy, I just want to emphasize that all of this, uh, these tools, and this community for social annotation are happening at a time when uh, uh, chatbots, ChatGPT, and all of that uh, are are could lead, one could imagine them leading to the great summarization of, uh, of, of, of material. Uh, you could imagine it being uh, very easy to just summarize this material and sort of use chatbots to get around engaging actively with the academic literature. And I, I don't think this will be too controversial in this environment, but I'll just say I, I think um, the a summary of an academic paper, especially uh, in humanities and social sciences, is no more a replacement for the actual engagement of the of the text than a cliff note summary or review is of an amazing piece of, of uh, an amazing novel. You need to actually do the hard work to engage with what the words on the page and hypothesis creates an environment for that to happen, which uh, can be really, really powerful. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jeremy to tell you a little bit about Hypothesis. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, yeah, there'll be a little bit of repetition and reiteration of some of these points, which I think is great. Um, I really appreciate the point about chat GPT and summary, but also Alex, you know, that that's why I assigned um, JSTOR articles alongside of the text I was teaching in my English courses, both in high school and college was because I wanted them to engage in that deep and difficult kind of scholarly writing um, that, that JSTOR hosts. Um, so at Hypothesis, we talk about uh, social annotation as um, making reading active, visible, and social. So that first part, you know, Alex mentioned this. I mean, first of all, we don't always know that students are doing the reading, maybe even more so with ChatGPT, but really making them into active readers, doing the reading, and then doing the reading in thoughtful, deep ways. Um, this is a tool that can, you know, bridge that many of us have annotated, you know, on paper, but this is a tool that can allow you to do that and allow your students to do that in a digital environment. Um, it also makes it visible, right? The, the haptic uh, experience of annotating or, or highlighting in the text is part of what helps us comprehend it, part of what helps us start to make it our own and to think critically about it. And you can really see that when, you, when you've highlighted a text. And, you know, again, this is a way to see um, where, you know, where you've annotated and what you're thinking about and help kind of create those pathways, both neural pathways, but also pathways in the text back to uh, key points. And then finally, I don't think Alex got this far yet in terms of taking my marketing language, but um, it, Hypothesis makes reading social. And this is really the kind of newest piece, I think, of uh, social annotation in the digital environment, right? Uh, when, I annotate, when I read, when I read and when I annotated in college, I did so for myself. I wasn't showing anybody those annotations. Um, but one of the really neat things that when you take annotation into the digital environment is that added social affordance which is really, really important for undergrads. I have a theory that I haven't proven yet. I'll publish something, you know, and maybe it'll appear in JSTOR at some point that a lot of students, you know, when they're reading and, and isolate, have an isolated experience of reading, they get lost and they might give up, right? They might stop reading. And at worst, they may, you know, drop the course or even drop out of college because the reading can be very isolated, especially, no offense, Alex, some of that stuff on JSTOR is dense and difficult and sort of makes you feel like, oh, do I belong here? You know, I don't totally understand it. So it's helpful. Um, to have a, a tool like Hypothesis, but also to have your teacher be present um, in the margins as you're reading and have your classmates present. I was just reading some feedback from a user that said it's very powerful to see that other students are struggling with the same concepts, right? Not everybody opens a JSTOR article and immediately understands all the words and all the references, right? You need to annotate, you need to look things up, 
And when you do that socially and you sort of understand it as a collaborative uh, uh, process, um, it's quite powerful. So um, technically, what is hypothesis? Uh, for most of the folks here that are associated with academic institutions, I've seen that we have a range of folks from uh, classroom educators to librarians. You're probably familiar with the learning management system. Well, Hypothesis integrates with the learning management system with all the LTI compliant ones. You see the logos there on the right. And if you're a classroom instructor, you can make your readings that are in the LMS annotatable. Um, add an annotation layer to the stuff that you're already uh, teaching. Um, you can also grade annotation sets. And this is a really important part of it, right? Truly making the reading required, right? If, you, if you're just sort of expected to kind of appear attentive in class uh, as, as a sort of check on the reading. Um, this is a better way. The students actually have to open the text. They actually have to click through and get to JSTOR. They have to, have to read some part, anchor an annotation, or maybe more than one. Um, and then you can assess it. And of course, you can choose how you can uh, assess it. It could be a kind of complete incomplete thing, or you could have something more rigorous uh, as a rubric in terms of what you expect students to do um, with their annotations. Um, so what does the JSTOR hypothesis integration look like? Uh, in just a second, I will share the link to this deck so you have it for posterity. Um, but I do have some slides in here that walk you through the workflow, but I'm going to click out of my presentation right now and uh, actually go to Hypothesis. You guys still seeing my screen? I'm not getting a good um, sort of visual. Uh, we see your whole, uh, desktop? Your whole desktop. All right. So you see like pictures of my kids and other things I've been. Uh, your kids look uh, a little purple wavy. It's kind of. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Now we're in a better place. Just seeing uh, JSTOR here. OK, so I'm on JSTOR. Uh, I found an article I want to teach. Um, and I'm going to uh, grab this uh, stable URL uh, for later. And then I'm going to go to my learning management system. This one happens to be Canvas, uh, very similar in Blackboard, D2L, and other LMSs. So this is a course. Um, and I'm going to add a reading to the course. Uh, I'm going to go up here and plus and go external tool. Um, and of course, we have all this documented on our website, the workflows on how to do this in the various LMSs. Um, and when you go through the hypothesis workflow, there are a number of places that you can point hypothesis to to get to, to have add an annotation layer on that reading. It could be a URL or a PDF that's online. It could be a PDF in Canvas. Alex mentioned this workflow. You know, a lot of teachers, you know, download or or have those PDFs from a variety of resources in a folder somewhere. Uh, I've heard a lot of teachers will have them in a course, just living in a course, and then when they copy the course, it copies the readings. Um, so PDFs might appear, you know, might be in the the storage for the LMS itself. They might be in an external uh, cloud storage provider like Google or Microsoft. But now we've added this direct connection uh, to JSTOR. So as Alex pointed out or you know, being copyright compliant by truly going to JSTOR. We're uh, you know, making sure that librarians and JSTOR you know, register this usage as usage uh, through this direct integration. And when I click on this option, I mean, in these other ones, just really quickly, I can drop the URL. I can you know, look at the files in a course. Um, and then for the JSTOR integration, I click here. And this is where that uh, stable URL comes into hand. Uh, I paste that in here, click this little arrow, Click this little arrow. Yeah, click this little arrow, and then you know it's recognized, and I'm accepting the JSTOR terms and conditions when I accept and uh, continue. I can I'll make a flag here. Can I, yeah. can I just chime in? The other thing that's happening there is because Jeremy is a teacher at this school. Um, it's checking to make sure that that school has access to the material in JSTOR because schools have different levels of access in JSTOR, and so it makes sure at that level. Um, that if the teacher has access, then it just assumes that if the teacher does, every student from then on at that institution will have access. Thanks, uh, Alex. Um, so I've named the, the assignment here. I'm going to tell it to load in a new page so that we got lots of real estate for the text and for the annotation layer. So I'll add that item. I'll publish it. And then when I open it up and click the second time, um, you'll see the JSTOR article. It'll appear much as if you had gone directly to JSTOR. Um, and then this is the annotation layer over here. There's no annotations because I just added it. But now I can select text. This is going to be somewhat meta, right? Because I've got a yellow highlighter right here. I can highlight text. 
uh, which is a private act. You're seeing this because you're seeing my screen, but normally that, you know, hypothesis can be used for private annotation and highlight, um, but it can also be used to, uh, to annotate socially within, in this case, the members of this uh, course. Um, so well, PDFs give me a little bit of trouble here, um, but I can annotate and, you know, hypothesis has this little WYSIWYG window where you can enter text, you can format that text, you can add a link uh, to other texts, uh, you can add an image or a video, um, you can actually add LaTeX if you're, you know, want to write math equations. Um, but you have something in here you can tag. This is not a, a true how-to kind of tutorial of using hypothesis, just to give you the sort of broad uh, vision of what's possible here with the tool. And then, of course, we have lots of resources if you want to dig deeper around how the tool works and uh, ways to leverage the tool in, in various courses. Um, but that's the basics. Um, we're annotating a JSTOR article here, and we're doing so in the right way, uh, directly going to JSTOR and directly registering the hit and uh, being compliant in all the ways that are important for um, for this space. Um, so let me go back to my presentation here. Again, in the deck, and I'll grab the link to the deck so you guys can have it and um, have it for posterity. I'll drop that into the chat. Um, and then I'll just say a couple more things before I hand it over to Laisha. Um, which is, and I think Leisha will go into more detail about this, right? She's the true practitioner. But from my perspective, um, this isn't just about, you know, social annotation of content on JSTOR. JSTOR is one source. And of course, if you're a teacher, you're likely ag somewhat agnostic. JSTOR is pretty hip, I got to say, but you're likely agnostic about where the source is. You're looking for articles on Hamlet and maybe they're at, at JSTOR, likely they're at JSTOR, but they may be someplace else. So really what we're talking about is social annotation of scholarly writing, that kind of difficult prose that Alex mentioned, that it's really important uh, and, well, it's very difficult for uh, undergraduate students to learn to read that kind of writing, um, and it's important to provide scaffolding. Um, and so I'll just gesture to sort of four different ways that I see this as valuable, social annotation is valuable for the uh, reading of scholarly writing. The first is teachers can uh, scaffold the reading themselves. They can go in and create annotations that help students through the text. Um, the second is, and this has sort of been hammered home already, and I think Leisha will uh, too, um, it helps students develop those metacognitive skills to sort of, what are you doing when you read? What are you doing when you annotate? What is the intellectual work that you're doing? It helps develop that, right? To sort of say, I'm going to select text, and now I'm going to do something with that text, and instructors can help guide that uh, more deliberately. It encourages peer-to-peer -peer learning. Again, when you have your peers also asking questions in the text, also answering questions, looking things up, helping each other through the text, that's incredibly powerful social um, and knowledge building experience. Um, and then finally, you know, it, in, it nurtures critical thinking. Um, if you have access to the deck, which I'll drop into the chat in just a second, as soon as I shut up, um, you'll also have access to some, uh, to a guide on how to use hypothesis with JSTOR, um, and then some sample assignments that are about the reading of academic articles um, and how to help students you know, read academic articles in different disciplines and with different kind of approaches. Um, and with that, I am going to hand it over to Aisha. Hi, everybody. Thank you um, for being here. I'm so excited to be uh, with Jeremy and Alex and share my experiences of using hypothesis in the classroom. I've been a, um, a very happy, um, user for four semesters now, and it is completely revolutionized. That's not too strong a word. What I do in the classroom, and this is after 25 years of teaching as a university professor, this has made such a big, big difference in the way I teach and as a consequence in the way students are responding to the material in my classroom. That's just giving me sort of a, a new love, a second, a second wind really at uh, thinking about teaching uh, more students for the next, hopefully the next 25 years. That would be, that would be wonderful. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, the perennial problem in at least the college level, and I know we're talking to a range of folks who teach it in different kinds of institutions, but, but I bet it happens in other places as well, is that they do not read assigned materials. And I do not say this with any kind of 
you know, w with anything but empathy. Um, this is just, you know, there's a lot of things to do when one is a college student, a lot of other assignments, a lot of classes, students are working, trying to put themselves through college, and they might have the desire to read or the intention to read, but it's one of the first things that's going to go off the to-do list as they're thinking about how to get through their week and their semester. And so they often don't do their signed readings unless they're really pressed. And if they're pressed through but the, the before hypothesis, the technique, the techniques we had, you know, to ensure that students were doing reading, especially difficult academic reading, were through pop quizzes, you know, threatening to do cold calls in the classroom, that is to call on somebody's name and say, what did you think about this reading? Can you tell me the answer to this, this, or this? Um, and some other kind of unpleasant confrontation, which is, it just degrades the course experience in my mind. Uh, one bullet item that I don't have here that I that I should is that as we work to make our classrooms very inclusive, that feels like a very oppositional kind of move and doesn't bring people to you uh, to be able to talk about, especially difficult topics that are happening in the in the world. So it's sort of antithetical to, I think, these movements of a, a creating a learning community and an inclusive one in our classroom classrooms. And it also, it limits what, you know, as instructors can assume when they walk through that door, they don't know really what their students, how prepared their students are and what they, you know, we usually presume that, you know, some subset has read the reading and we're going to have to go over the material to be able to move on to the next major installment of a, of a course or concept that's going to happen that day. And so what I find is that with with without this required reading, and I only require readings that really are required, they really help the learning experience, it drives the whole of the classroom to the lowest common denominator, that is, to the students who have not read. Um, next slide, slide please. Um, and so um, what, what I have found with hypoth hypothesis is that it moves readings from this periphery, from the periphery of the classroom. So, you know, being being happy that a few students have read the thing, read the material, but that I know I have to go to the to the, to the core of it again. So it moves it from this periphery peripheral kind of activity activity to something that is actually at the center. And then now for me, it's really become a cornerstone. And interestingly, my students will say, "God, you know, Palin." Well, they're, they're saying the they're saying the swear word a little bit less. Palin requires so much reading. But I've learned so much in this class because it becomes this essential component that I can then build on and then do the other difficult things that I want to do in the class. So it moves from the periphery to the center and then to a cornerstone in the whole of the class. It also makes readings, the, the articles, sites for interaction. It becomes a place outside the classroom where uh, we can support peer-to-peer -peer learning and instructor interaction, as Jeremy has so has so nicely explained. And I really think of it as a kind of coaching to go to the point of what Alex was 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 presenting um, earlier. I find that if I can, when I support by giving prompting annotations, I feel like I'm that coach, that person whispering in their ear as they're getting through a difficult piece of work to say, here's what's happening here. Let me explain it to you in the words we've used in the classroom, or maybe skip this part. We're going to get to that when we have a little bit more advanced knowledge, but get to this next part. This is what I really want you to know for, for Monday. And so it really becomes this additional site outside the classroom for this wonderful interaction. And what I find is that you know, students who tend to be quiet in the classroom, or if I have a very large classroom and people just feel uncomfortable speaking aloud in a big classroom, they aren't in hypothesis. One, because it's required, but two, they just have the, they're, they're speaking when they have a moment to think about what they want to say. Maybe they're able to speak and feel comfortable at 10 o'clock at night, but not at 9 a.m. in the morning when the class is. So it's really a wonderful place to extend classroom. Um, and then finally, it uh, it just, um, yeah, I would say that this whole experience together ignites this appreciation for deep engagement in the readings once students really start seeing how the accrual of all that reading really is bolstering their, their, their knowledge. Next slide, please. So um, I think we are on, let's see. Yep. Thank you. So I, um, I'm going to give you an example from 
um, a course I teach in a new discipline at CU, University of Colorado called information science. And that's my area of research and it's my area of teaching. It's the social life, the, the it's about the social life of information or human data interaction is what information science is. And so this is, there's not a lot of textbooks about this quite yet. Um, and so this course that I teach at the sophomore level is really tackling sort of this core idea of the social life of information, which is a very funny, it's a strange concept and it's a hard things to explain. And so, um, uh, uh, and what we have are again, not textbooks, but uh, published academic articles to explain what this is and show how it works. So what the, show what the show, social life of information means in action and what it means when we take that as our lens of inquiry, our object of inquiry. So um, in one paper that was particularly ambitious, but it was similar to other kinds of papers that I've assigned is that um, students were reading a paper and I was one of the co-authors. So it was kind of, we're bringing research into the classroom um, on how, uh, on disinformation and how uh, COVID-19 vaccines and medical racism um, uh, are kind of came together in some difficult spaces online um, to discourage certain populations to not take the COVID-19 vaccine. I'm sorry, I didn't explain that very well. The anti-vaccine movement and that collective action movement was coming together uh, with those who were vaccine hesitant and discouraging particular members of our society particularly Black Americans, not to take the vaccine. And so this is a very complicated and damaging space and a very fraught space, as you can imagine, and a space for which a topic for which students in our classroom who come from all walks of life had very different opinions going in about any of those, any of those topics. And so not only were they engaging with difficult and politically polarizing topics, they also had to engage with methods that included both qualitative social science methods and big data data science methods in this one paper. So these are sophomores. They're 19 years old, 20 years old, and hadn't been exposed to a lot of these things together. So next slide, please. So um, my approach was to, um, I think I've said most of this before, but I'll just briefly say, but to compel deep reading of what was a 30 page paper, have them come back into the classroom so we could take apart these methods and really discuss these issues as well for how they wanna think about battling disinformation when they go, when they, when they leave our university. Um, and so uh, and again, using the reading as a site for interaction, my goal was to help them help each other get through a difficult reading I can coach them getting through a difficult reading. And then this is the thing, I want them to bring their reading selves back into the classroom without me having to start from scratch and explain a very difficult set of topics that covered 30 pages that I couldn't cover in an hour and a half lecture. There would be no way. They had to really spend time with it. All right, so these are screenshots. Next slide, please. And I feel like it doesn't quite do the dynamism of hypothesis um, justice. If you haven't seen it in action, go to another tutorial that Hypothesis offers and see how wonderful this interaction can be. But you can see that this is a, um, just from the topic matter here, a fairly dense uh, paper. Um, and, um, and what I have to the, to the right are some sample annotations um, of how students are reacting to, uh, um, in this case, um, how vulnerable populations might feel. Um, they're reacting to some of the methodological issues. And here you can see at the, where my, you see my name, that's my prompt. And I'm asking them to, re I, they have to understand the background for this, which is the Tuskegee syphilis study. And it's a historical, um, uh, uh, a terrible event that the um, uh, that was a study run by the by the United States um, and uh, implicated. Sorry, it it um, it was a study that for three decades watched the evolution of syphilis in black men who lived in Tuskegee um, and didn't give them the uh, 
remedy of penicillin in the 1940s when it became available. And it wasn't until the 1970s that this study was stopped. And this is a very complex thing to study on its own. And folks had to understand this to then know how Tuskegee, as um, uh, a study that the US government was involved in, was now being invoked to discourage people to, from taking COVID-19 vaccines. So what you can see here is this blue box shows you that 42 of my students reply of the, I think I had 47 in my class that year, reply to this prompt. Now, if I could show you the dynamism of this in real life, you would see, but I couldn't without showing you the student names, which is why we can't show this to you. You would see some really thoughtful, reflexive responses to not just this Tuskegee study story, what many of them are hearing for the first time about, but you see it in everything that they do. So if you go to the next slide, um, I ask another question, um, which is off the screen here, but I ask them to respond to the polyvocality part of this paper, which is the different complicated voices, that the voices that make disinformation hard to understand. Whoop, can you go back? There we go. Thank you. Um, that make disinformation hard to um, uh, take apart because it's not a simple yes or no, true or false. Uh, the space is polyvocal and the information is very confusing to, to readers because the stories become confusing because the logics that people are presenting about whether to comply to the vaccine are quite difficult. So this is called the polyvocality of, disin of information disorder. So I asked them to respond to this. Um, and again, it's this is just the little tiniest snippet and you can see each annotation for each student says more and more, right? So they're giving very long annotations and responses to my question of, now that you've been exposed to these 12 voices, how do you come to understand them? And all 44 readers of this paper of the 44 seven students in my class went through this exercise and did this. Okay, so next slide. So you can imagine what this does to the classroom the next day after students have had this experience. First of all, they've read, they feel a sense of personal pride because they've learned a tremendous amount. They've gotten through a very difficult piece of work and they feel um, in the area of information science, they're getting what they crave and they understand how they can have an impact going forward um, as information scientists and battling something like disinformation and how all those methods and these big ideas come together. But they feel really cared for. And that's something I really, I think I didn't expect. They are getting support on how to learn, on how to read. CU is a big public university. We serve all of Colorado. We serve the region. And of course we serve the world and international students as well. But we get many, many students who are first generation students who transfer from community colleges and, you know, or have it. But most and many don't know, I would say, sorry, many and maybe even most don't know how to read a paper like that without this kind of coaching. Um, and so um, as you know, as I go through papers like this over the semester, I had about eight like this in my sophomore class, very challenging. They came, they got better and better at this critical reading and they became more and more self-disciplined. And so, um, you know, I, this sounds like I'm bragging a little bit about myself. Um, I don't mean it to sound like that. What I'm trying to suggest is I don't think I got this kind of feedback until I was able to serve, have this kind of mechanism in my classroom because um, I really could jam pack a course in uh, with material and, and they felt great coming out of it, like it was worth their while. Next slide, please. And so the one thing though that I think that is perhaps the hardest to understand until one has experienced this is it's not just that each person has read and I know it and I'm able to give them points for having read. It's the impact that happens when everyone has read that very difficult article. And you know, not just the instructor, but every single student walks in that door that next morning and they know that essentially everyone else had the same experience they had. And that creates the idealized classroom experience 
because it means that we all are eager to start at this next level up rather than having to require me to go through the basics. They are ready to talk. They are ready to work. They're ready to apply that information. And that's been the game changer for me completely and why I've had this sort of new renaissance and a new love of teaching because of that. And you can imagine, next slide please, that when this happens in just one classroom and how 50 people, again, that happened this semester, just have come out of it so excited as we finish our semester this week. Um, this is just one classroom experience. Imagine if we could have this available to so many other classrooms. What kind of world could we start to create just through this wonderful and pretty easy to use tool um, of Hypothesis? So thank you so much. Thank you, Alicia. That's wonderful. I uh, really appreciate you joining us today and sharing your experience with uh, with your students. I'm, and I'm glad that it's uh, it's exciting for you um, uh, to, 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 to be in that situation. Um, all right, so we're going to ch transition to discussion. Um, I do have a slide here ahead of that um, that addresses some of the questions that are out there, um, which is several of you have asked, well, how do I get my hands on this? Um, so right now, this is a pilot integration being offered to mutual customers of Hypothesis and JSTOR. So your institution has to subscribe to JSTOR, and your institution has to subscribe to Hypothesis. And if that's the case, reach out to us at Education at Hypothesis, and we'll, we do have to check your contract to make sure everything is, is uh, buttoned up there. Um, but in all likelihood, you'll be able, we'll be able to enable you enable integration at your institution. And if you're not yet a customer of one or the other, I guess you should drop some Ithaca uh, uh, sales email address in here, Alex, but if you're not yet a Hypothesis customer, everybody's already a JSTOR customer. Um, if you're not yet a Hypothesis customer, uh, you can reach out also to Education at Hypothesis and um, and get in touch with us, and we can talk about uh, getting you uh, started with a summer boost, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But let's get to some of the questions that have been an asked and answered in the Q&A, and I will say in the hecticness of the slides and listening to my colleagues and other back channel things to try to make this work, I accidentally pressed answer live on a really great question that then disappeared into the ether. So if that person doesn't get their question answered, please, uh, we have lots of time here to re-articulate it. But um, we answered questions about the partnership. Um, there were several questions about accessibility. Um, and I want to speak to that from a hypothesis perspective. And then Alex, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about what's going on with the integration with JSTOR. Um, but for Hypothesis to really work on a text, the text needs to be accessible. The PDF needs to be accessible, right? Um, because Hypothesis allows students and, and readers to select characters, you know, words, phrases in the text and actually select them. And then they appear, if you saw in the demo earlier, as the referent in the annotation pane. Um, so the text need to be accessible already, and we talk about that with our users all the time, help them with OCR. We actually have an optical character recognition um, tool that folks can use to convert um, not inaccessible PDFs into accessible PDFs. Um, so that's the hypothesis piece, but then, Alex, there's some really pretty cool thing going on behind the scenes when, um, when we're pointing to those JSTOR articles in terms of accessibility, right? Uh, well, so I'll just say that the JSTOR articles, all JSTOR articles are accessible as well. We have the text underlying them. Um, uh, some of that OCR that we have on, on the primary JSTOR platform, you know, JSTOR has been around for 20, 30 years. So the uh, optical character recognition algorithms that do that um, have gotten better since then. So when a teacher assigns uh, the the an article we are re OCRing it on the fly to ensure that it's the best quality uh, it can be um, for the annotation. Um, it's still these, these are often page scan they're often page scan as opposed to born digital. So sometimes it could be a little wonky. I think you saw Jeremy uh, struggle a little bit with highlighting the text when you're jumping from a block of text to another block of text. But it's good enough to be able to do that kind of that kind of work. And do I remember something about it improving over time, or is that magical thinking that like that first time that I brought that in, that if I brought it in a second time, it might get re-OCR'd and get better in quality every time it gets opened, or is that crazy talk? I think that's crazy talk. Okay. I think you made All something right. up. All right. We'll have to check on that. I feel like <laughs> I heard that at some point. But anyway, yeah, um, OCR is a big part of the annotation process and both Hypothesis and, and JSTOR super dedicated to um, making sure that these texts uh, and, and the technology that, uh, that you know, the hypothesis 
uh, tool itself is also WCAG AA 2.0, 2.1 compliant. Um, so yeah, accessibility is a huge part of this. Um, another question, uh, there's a series of questions around the socialness of annotation versus the individualness of annotation, private anonymous annotation. Um, and also, I don't know how to, to, to paraphrase this one, but somebody asked about can st students um, annotate without seeing their colleagues and then have a, a switch flipped where then everybody's annotations appear. So I'm going to answer some of that from my perspective and then hear from my colleagues. I think one piece especially I'd like to hear from Laisha. Um, in terms of functionality, uh, you know, hypothesis can be used either for private annotation um, or for social annotation. And that social annotation can be either the entire group, uh, everybody in the course, um, I can also, as the instructor, split folks into groups. So I don't know if you did this, Laisha, but you have a 50-person course. These are dense articles. Maybe everybody's on one text. But you could have had the option of splitting that into two groups of 25. And then she would also have the option in Canvas and in other LMSs of creating groups of two, herself and each student in the course, right? So you could create it such that you're actually going to look at those different layers, right? Did Alex do his reading? Does he understand the article in isolation, not in conversation with others? Now, of course, the tool is built. The idea being the social piece is, is critical, right? That reading those articles that Laisha assigns, it's not just about did Alex get it or do the reading to Laisha, I imagine. It's also about um, student one has an idea and student two responds to that and builds on it. Student three takes it in a different direction and that social experience of knowledge production is, is part of what the tool is designed for. Um, so we don't currently have a feature that allows an article to be annotated without seeing other people's comments, and then a, a switch is flipped to, um, to reveal the others so that people would have a more isolated um, experience and then socialize that. Um, you could annotate privately and then, you know, be told, everybody ready? One, two, three, publish your annotations to the group. Um, but we have heard that feedback before for the user that or for the person that asked, and we do uh, we are you know considering that for feature development. The question, Alicia, that I thought was interesting was somebody asked about annotating anonymously, like that students are shy and might be more comfortable to to annotate um, anonymously. And you had talked about how, at least compared to class conversation, I think you said something about how some students who might not normally speak do find this to be a more comfortable space. So I just wonder if you can riff on that whole anonymity and in-class participation and social you know, uh, annotation participation? Yeah, it's a good question. I've not yet encountered the need to consider what it would mean to have a feature like that, which I, th I take as currently as good news that, um, that my students, you know, I've taught the graduate level, I've taught the upper division level, and I gave the example of lower division level. They haven't, no one has yet, no one has yet asked me what it, what it would mean to do something like that. They felt like they couldn't speak publicly. So um, I don't know exactly the psychology of that, if it's that it's part of a, um, grade and then so it's required so they're sort of overcoming their their fear of this or if I've been just lucky and I haven't had folks who felt like they couldn't speak yet and I might that might come up in the future um I would say that um a lot of that work of of building a sense of inclusiveness happens of course in all other ways in the classroom so that by the time they're finally coming to those readings, I would like to think they feel safe to right there. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I would say in addition, I have a lot of group activities, there's group projects, students do get to know each other. It's hard to stay anonymous in my class already up to even up to 50 people. So um, it wouldn't sort of be a precondition that they would know to act upon. Um, the other thing is we try very hard to allow as many voices as we can. Um, I did have one, you know, situation where someone was maybe a little insensitive to um, 
the lived experiences of another person and I saw that in the comments because I do watch them to prepare for teaching the next day and I just talked to that person on the side and said hey you know what do you think about this maybe we should let, let's talk about what you might have meant here and what we could do to help that other person feel um, a little better. Maybe your comments could be cast in a different way. So I, I tried to take what was that that one time I had a, a kind of concerning experience and turn it into as a much of a learning experience as I, as I could. But those have been my experiences to date. Just to say with up to 50 people, I like working in one group. I have not yet felt the need to divide that up. I think above 50, I would start doing that. But that density starts feeling good. It feels like this, I think to the students, it feels like, oh, everyone's here. This is what we do. I got to do this too. I got to be like, it. so there's a, perhaps some peer pressure um, a little bit at work. But again, I'd like to think it's done in other ways in my classroom in a, in a, in a constructive and supportive way. I hope yeah. that answers. Yeah, that's great. And more opportunity for collaboration, right? When the more, yeah. more voices are there. And when, when it's such dense content too, there's plenty of real estate, I think, to for, for everybody to find a foothold. It's more, what more happens is that students are learning from each other. And that's not just like an idealized thing. Uh, these papers are difficult. That's why I gave you this one as an example. And so it is completely fine with me if a student doesn't understand what's going on in a paragraph in a paper, but they read 30 other paragraphs to explain it. Some people worry about that being sort of, quote, cheating or not really thinking through it. But my view is if they've actually read 30 things and they can, they've learned over one paragraph by reading 30, they actually understand it that's as good a reading as anything, perhaps even better. So um, they aren't discouraged from seeking help from others. And I think that also supports them in not feeling like they have to be anonymous. Thanks, Leisha. And did either of you guys in the chaos of talking and listening and, and reading uh, in the chat and in the Q&A, see any cues that you want to uh, bring to the foreground here? There was one question about um, whether or not this pilot sort of um, elbows out the library. Um, and I just wanted to flag that I, I, I actually think it allows the library to have more of an impact. So the library is still the primary um, uh, uh, partner for JSTOR and this allows that material to be used in an avenue that will was there are hurdles to so it increases that access and the library should see that usage in their JSTOR reports um, and it increases the value of, of their the library holdings. Yeah, and I'll just add to that that in, in terms of the longer term vision, you know, one of the major pieces and when if you go back to Alex's slides around, I don't want to do this to you, but if you go back to um, the usage slide for JSTOR. Um, you know, some of this is obviously classroom use of JSTOR materials where there's um, an, an article assigned and everybody is reading it. Um, one of the major pieces of feedback we've gotten is that a lot of times when JSTOR content is used for coursework, it's more part of independent research, right? So an instructor might say, you've each chosen a specific topic, go find some articles and then um, bring them back and, and we'll, 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 you know, we'll, I'll talk to you about them. And, you know, of course, students are using the library and JSTOR um, outside of the context of the learning management system. And that's a sort of another use case that we would love to be able to unify with this very, you know, classroom, you know, teacher centric one where the teacher is assigning um, the article. So my dream is that one day, you know, students are showing up at the library, going to the computer to search for articles. And hypothesis is right there with them that no matter where they go, JSTOR, EBSCO, ProQuest, whatever, they have this little annotation tool that follows them um, and they can take notes and, and highlights and maybe form study groups and that some of that could be unified with coursework or maybe it's, you know, independent projects. But so we definitely think and hope that this is a long term aligned with um, with uh, the goals of, of, of academic libraries. Um, all these questions coming in at the 11th hour here. Um, so one question that got asked uh, just recently and also um, previously was, okay, you've got JSTOR and you might have noticed we have vital source in that menu of, of places to select text from. Uh, yes, uh, Hypothesis is looking to integrate with other partners. 
both ebook providers as well as uh, library aggregators and databases and things like that. So uh, stay tuned. We've been in conversation with some and are slowly working to build the partnerships that would underlie uh, additional pilots like this. Um, and, and that's, of course, uh, the goal is to have the ability to, no matter where your course content is coming from, you can point hypothesis to it and have, have this experience. Um, we only have about five minutes left, and Karen has asked this very deep question. What makes Hypothesis a more valuable tool than other uh, annotation tools? Lacey, do you want to take that one? <laughs> is, it, is it okay if I answer it since oh, I've sure. tried, um, so I've tried other, I've tried uh, uh, perusal. Um, I, so I come, because of my background in information science and computer science, you know, I, we've, um, and I know David Carger, who was, as it turns out, Jeremy, who was one of the authors on the paper that you use as an example. My community of researchers has been thinking about um, web annotation for, you know, be long before it was actually capable, state of the art. And so I've used, you know, research tools that, you know, weren't ready for commercial rollout. I used, um, if you remember Yammer, they used to have a kind of documentation uh, annotation tool that was meant for corporate use that I hacked into a classroom setting, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. I've used, so that's what I've used. And Hypothesis is so much, so Hypothesis, I'm, I love Hypothesis. They didn't have to sell it to me. I was looking for, when all those other solutions weren't working for me, because Yammer, either Yammer went away, it was harder for me to use, and I couldn't put it integrated into Canvas. And then I found Perusal really clunky. Sorry, Perusal, I, I know it serves a purpose, but I liken it to like when you're going through a grocery store with a grocery cart and you find out too late that it's got that wonky wheel and you're fighting your whole way through the grocery store and you just can't get it around the curves and you're not really thinking about the groceries and what you need. You're thinking about this stupid cart you have because you can't make it work. Um, hypothesis feels like that smooth running grocery shopping cart that you're not even thinking about. You're thinking about trying new things or what do you need or getting through something efficiently. It's just so easy to use. The, the, the features that it has are well designed. They are, they're not clunky. There's, there aren't, it isn't buggy. And so it just makes it easy. And the integration in my case with Canvas, I'm sure with other LMSs is just, it's, th that is what sells it. That's what makes it possible for that reading to be, readings to become the cornerstone of the, um, of the experience because I can incorporate it into the teaching, their grading rubric. And that really, you know, that is a contract between student and teachers. And that does help along with all the coaching and the, the good vibes I try to give them to, to share why teaching is so wonderful. So that's my experience. I do want to add one. That's amazing, Lisa. Thank you so much. I do want to add one thing, which I think is important in the context of this webinar, right? Teachers can download JSTOR articles and print them out and give them to students. Teachers can download JSTOR articles and put them in the LMS. That's not that's not copyright compliant. Um, it's not true to the library's you know arrangement with JSTOR. Um, hypothesis from the start has always been really dedicated. We do not host content. We always want to go where the content lives to respect its source and to follow compliance in the way with JSTOR and things like that, but also to make sure we're dealing with the thing at its source, not a summary, not a copy, not some ingested version of it, right? And that's why we've done this partnership with JSTOR. We're in doing this with, with Vital Source to annotate on their platform. That's why we annotate on the actual web, not a copy of a web page, because web pages change. And so we annotate the page itself because it changes and the annotations should understand that, right? Um, and so that uh, that dedication to the source, rather than ingesting all text into some platform, you know, hypothesis is a tool, not a platform, and that's a big difference. Um, and that also just that is part of our DNA, and also is part of you know our deep integration with the LMS and the workflows therein, as opposed to porting people out to other platforms that ingest the text and kind of you know it's a different experience. Um, all right, we are at the hour here. I'm going to give myself one minute to run through the last few slides here. Sorry for this dizzy little experience here. Um, but uh, I did want to say, if you're already a Hypothesis partner, just want to remind you that there's lots of great resources. Some of our CS team, uh, success team is on the call today and been answering questions. Thank you to them. Um, they are educators by, uh, by calling. 
and they are authentically engaged with our educator partners around how this tool can be leveraged for teaching and learning. Um, they can do one-on-one -on -one instru uh, instructional design consultations, webinars for schools. We also have a, a, a hypothesis academy where you can get certified as a hypothesis educator, and uh, they also run regular workshops. If you're not yet a hypothesis customer, and I'll drop the link in education at hypothesis one more time before we go. Um, we do have a really great opportunity this summer to get started with a sum with our summer boost program. It's discounted pricing for the summer term uh, for all access to the tool for across a college or university. Um, so it is you know reduced pricing and, and complete access and a great time to experiment over the summer with some summer courses and then perhaps subscribe uh, in the fall. Um, and so get in touch at Education and Hypothesis, and I'll even drop this specific link here to the Boost program on our website so that you have that. Um, and with that, I just want to say it's been such a pleasure, as always, to be here with uh, both of you, Alex and Laisha. Um, I'm excited to rewatch this because I was a little distracted when some of you guys were talking, but <laughs> I, I could hear the power of what was being said. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to review the, the recording, which will get sent to everybody who attended today and everybody uh, who registered. Um, with that, I'll just say thanks again, Alex, Laisha. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Laisha. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have thanks. a great afternoon, folks. Bye.